Um, some of this is going to be stuff that you've already heard if you've been to these conferences before, but we want to make sure that new families uh, know all the information about the organization. So I'm going to just start off with kind of pointing out the obvious. You guys know this is a family conference, and the reason it is is because Ring 14 affects the whole family, and uh, it affects brothers and sisters and spouses and relationships and all of that. So you can't hardly talk about this without considering, um, considering the family. So I'm going to tell a little bit about Andrea and I's story with our family, and I hope that you're going to see that there's a lot of similarities between your story and my story. Um, but with us, when Marie was born, we had no idea that she had ring 14. So we didn't do any advanced testing or anything like that. So we didn't know. All we knew when she was born is this is this tiny little baby who's been gifted to us to love. And we went about three months before she had her first seizure. And uh, then, of course, we started digging in and finding out why. But something that I always like to, to point out, this is very different for every family, but I'm really glad that we didn't know in utero, <laughs> utero that she had ring 14. I'm really glad that we didn't spend those first three months waiting for that first seizure to happen. So I know that there's an argument to be made for being prepared for the future and everything. Um, but I kind of feel like we were blessed with those first three months. And um, yeah, they were, they were sweet. And, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that back. But when she was started having those seizures, um, like I said, I actually called Vicki, the nurse next door, the first time because she was laying in my lap. And it, it was like a little current went through her little body. It was so mild. And I was like, whoa, what was that? She just disappeared for about 15 seconds. And it was so quick that my husband didn't even see it. I was like, I don't know what happened, but that I've never seen that before. Um, and then she had another one the next day. And then a week later, uh, we'd actually made an appointment to go to the doctor when she went into a cluster. And so that's when we were rushed to the hospital. We kind of separated our daughters with our, we, we took our daughters over to the neighbors and we went, we immediately went to the hospital. They sent us to the children's hospital in Indianapolis. So we got to do the whole uh, riding in the ambulance scenario. Um, Andrew following behind me. And so I'm sure that we've all had that experience. I don't know when it happened for you, but um, it's a very scary time, you know, and we, we were in the hospital for about a week and we went home. They did all the tests. They were like, we don't know what's wrong. We, we don't see anything, you know, MRI looks normal. This looks normal. That looks normal. But they did a blood test. And so we were actually at our house when we got the diagnosis of ring 14. We had no idea what it meant. They had no idea what it meant. Uh, even the Children's Hospital <clears throat> in Indianapolis, Riley's great hospital, they'd only seen one patient that was a ring, I want to say it was 17, 21, 18, like a couple of years ago. So in all of their history. So uh, we kind of got an idea, wow, this is, this is not rare. This is ultra rare, you know? Um, my husband was, is, is a geneticist, and so he was able, we started looking at the literature and what there was. There were only uh, uh, dozens of papers back 13 years ago that were in the literature, and so uh, we really didn't know what the future was like. Um, now, there's a pretty good list of stuff that you know that you're gonna approach at, with your child, some of the challenges. So top of the list is always this drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, we have global delays in all kinds, motor and um, fine motor, large motor, 
uh, immune deficiencies, digestive problems, low tone, learning disabilities, language acquisition problems, although some of our kids are verbal, these autistic traits kind of sometimes paired with behavioral problems. Um, the kids are little, and, and then we're finding that scoliosis is a trend among our children also. But I will say that sometimes when you see this list, it doesn't mean a lot until you see it, right, in your, in your child and everything. And so, you know, in Marie's early days, um, we weren't afflicted by all of these challenges at once. It's kind of like you get to know each challenge as they come up. Um, what was a problem from the very beginning, oh my God, is she cute or what? Can I just say, oh, our kids are so cute, my goodness. So, um, but always epilepsy, okay, from the very beginning. So in the middle, you can see her little head wrapped up with, a, with an EEG. Um, we actually have never caught a seizure on EEG. We think it's the best AED, AED that we found. <laughs> just, just wrap her up in an EEG. We once did a three-day ambulatory EEG uh, and had her all wrapped up for three days. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We took her back to Indianapolis. We unhooked her, and I kid you not, she had a seizure on the drive home from the hospital. Uh, you know, am I right? They're so hard to capture. They're so wily. Um, but when she was little, the things that we noticed immediately, always the epilepsy, the big disruptor in your life, right? Um, but milestones are a little bit further out. Uh, really happy to see how, how mobile some of your kids are. It's fantastic. Um, Marie did not walk until she was seven, and even now she needs a hand. So we, we've had real problems with this gross motor, and of course all of this is complicated by medications and stuff like that. Uh, so some of these medications are our best friends and our worst friends also. Um, Low tone has always been a huge problem with Marie, and then of course the, the small stature. But this is kind of, but when, when they're little, right, you, you don't realize that, you're, that these learning disabilities and these language problems, like they're coming. Um, so we really still, when she was five, it was hard to imagine still what life was gonna be with, like with her when she progressed from toddler to little girl to now we have a 13 year old to a teenager. So kind of at each stage, there's different things that, that become more prominent in your life. Uh, so now at 13, still the epilepsy, but for us, we've had a little bit of problems with this recurring pneumonia. Uh, we didn't have it this year, but for four years in a row, we've kind of had a stint in the hospital with that. Um, Marie got a feeding tube when she was about 10. We could no longer keep up with her nutritional uh, needs and her uh, fluid intake. Her seizure patterns changed and we just couldn't do it. And, and she's not a child who tells me I'm hungry, I'm hungry. So. Um, Anyway, th this was a big deal when it came up, and there are big, hard decisions sometimes to, to handle with um, whether or not to, to go with the G-tube and how to handle those. And so, um, you know, when we counsel other parents, because a lot of times parents counsel parents, um, it's good to have these ideas floating around in your head that these are possibilities. I'm really thankful that I had mothers who were older than me saying, this might be helpful, Lisa, this might be helpful. You know, because sometimes you have to get used to an idea and everything. So um, anyway, that's still a struggle. Uh, as, as they get older, you realize for Marie, she's kind of stuck in the two-year-old age bracket, which I love toddlers, so that's, predominant, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but you realize that your life now, um, it looks the same with your child. So there's this idea that physically they grow and mentally they don't grow. They kind of stay. 
And so one of the challenges is how do you keep life fresh for these kids? How do you keep entertaining a child who's kind of on the same, you know, who hasn't progressed? And so that, that's a challenge to uh, do. And it's a challenge for me personally to, um, to not get bored with the stage that they're at. Does that make sense? Um, and language acquisition problems. So with Marie, um, she's had, she actually was much more verbal, had more sign language at age three than she does at 13. So what we have, we've kind of gained skills and then we lose skills. And so we gain skills and then we lose skills. Um, and then the scoliosis is, is a looming problem for us. Um, what I was really unprepared for as a young parent is the possibility that there might be regressions of skills. And so that's something that, um, I don't know, I guess in a certain way we're still coming to terms with a little bit. Um, so this doesn't, you know, one, one of the things that I want to stress with this group is that we're talking about a population of 20. And so we don't have at our fingertips statistics like other organ, other syndromes do. So what we have is, um, is stories and anecdotes and things like that to guide us. So when I talk about my story, it doesn't necessarily mean it's your story. So we have things in common, but there's also going to be a great deal of variation in our stories because until we get a larger population, there's not much that we can say, you know what I mean, globally about our kids. And of course, even with a large, you know, one of the things about statistics is it's just a general trend. It doesn't say what your child is going to do. Um, but, but I think that you can see that there's, there's going to be similarities in our stories, but there's also going to be differences. For instance, like I've said many times, our main thing is the epilepsy. With Ari, not so much so, but he's had problems that Marie hasn't had. You see what I'm saying? And so, uh, so anyway, as, as our kids get older, there's still always this question about we're not quite sure what the future holds, okay? But we want to do something, <laughs> right? We want to do something about it. Um, there, there's a friend of ours who's in the uh, nonprofit community with epilepsy, and her name is Tracy Salazar. And one of the first times that I met her uh, at an a at American Epilepsy meeting, she started off the meeting with. Seizures suck. I know, seizures suck, suck, suck. Okay, what are we going to do about it, <laughs> you know? And so at some point, we want to accept the fact that we have challenges, but what are we, what are we, what are we going to do? How can we improve this for our kids? What can we do? And so that's really what this foundation is all about. So I want to share a little bit of the history of Ring 14. So Ring 14 was founded in Italy uh by Stefania and Brunella is that her name uh so two moms who said let's let's do something about this and uh they had their first international conference in 2006 uh in Italy Marie was she was born in 2005 she was right around 15 months old I got to meet Sylvia and Meyer at that first meeting in Italy and so uh, when I see you guys here, you guys remind me of what it was kind of like when I was at that first meeting. Um, it's a long time ago, but we got to see kind of, we got to see kids young and kids old and kind of see, you know, try to get an idea of what this syndrome was. Um, we had a second conference in 2008 and then uh, Stefania led uh, a camp. She got Camp Dynamo. This is uh, an offshoot of the Paul Newman's Hole in the Kid camps. And they have a beautiful hole in the wall. 
holding the kids. Did I say that? That's terrible. It's terrible. Hole in the wall. Yes. But beautiful facility up there, but directed towards the whole family to care for the siblings, to care for the adults and everything. And so um, all of this she organized. If you haven't met Stefania, uh, she is a force of nature. I mean, she just has willed all this stuff into action and uh, very indebted to her leadership and to her very determined approach. Um, so some of the things that they did early, Italy really did function right then as an international organization, okay? So, so they included all of the people. Um, they funded postdocs, they did research grants, uh, and Marco's going to tell us much more about the research thing. But what I'm saying is that when we got involved, when we got there, Stefania already had a vision for this organization, that they were going to get up and they were going to do stuff. Um, and from the very first time that I met her, Stefania was like, when are you going to organize in the United States? When are you going to get stuff going? And um, we were still very new to this, and it was a lot to consider what we could actually do to help. And so it really wasn't until this first international research workshop that um, we were invited to. We were invited to it because, this is my husband Andrew thinking very hardly, uh, hard about this stuff, but he's, he got invited because of his research background and um, they want to involve parents with expertise. We've all actually got another parent um, who works at Yale, Pietro, and he is a member of the National Academy, and his daughter is 20 in her mid-20s right now. And he, when he, when his daughter was little, they didn't have a Ring 14 organization. He kind of quit looking, you know what I mean? And it wasn't until another life circumstance got brought him to the internet because his brother had some kind of cancer involved on the 14th chromosome that he found this organization and he was like, really? He's from Italy, you know, he spends all of his summers there. He met Stefania and he was like, okay, this is the real deal. And he helped organize this conference. And uh, he handpicked these researchers from all over the world. Uh, we, had some, we had some very important people at this first conference uh, who really knew nothing about Ring 14. But if you invite somebody to Italy, they tend to come. <laughs> They're like, okay. And so anyway, it was, it was very effective. And when we got back from this conference and we heard about the grants that might come out of this conference, that was really the tipping point for me. Like, I, what can I do to help this organization? Like, I wanna be involved. I want to help this move forward. So in 2011, five mothers here in the United States uh, got together and we we formed Ring 14 USA. Sylvia was one of our original board me board members. Uh, Christina is a board member and now uh, Heather is, but they've come on a little bit later. But the pro but the thing is that, is that it was driven by women, you know, uh, and men who helped. But the women were the ones who who originally got the organization going. I do want to stress that we actually advocate for all the rare syndromes on the 14th chromosome. So um, we can learn stuff from these people that have uh, deletions or just translocations, like we can do cross studies, but plus they need a home to go to. So it's, there's, like, there's kind of a lot in a name, okay? And it's nice to have a syndrome with a name that you can kind of rally around because when your child is just one and all, all they have is a little deletion in this portion, like they need a home too and it's hard for them to find each other and everything. So even though most of the families who come to us find us, they have ring 14, 
Um, we really do want to encourage all those families with other problems on the 14th that there were a home for them, okay? Um, but we, our, our goals are research, awareness, and support, and sometimes the emphasis of which one we're focusing on will change. But I just want to tell you a little bit about each of those. Um, research is really coordinated through Ring 14 International. So let me go to this slide first. Um, so way back, it was just Italy and then the United States, okay? And then once we had two national organizations, Stefania and I knew that what we really needed was an international because we want, what we don't want is for individual countries to be doing research independently. What we want is to maximize the, our funding and the resources of our kids. So we want to work together as an international community to do all research. So that's kind of the organization of, is this is kind of our, our parents, so to speak, okay? And all the national organizations are directors to the international organization. So each of us has this place on the board. So we have, we, we have a national organization in France and in Spain, and then unfortunately the United Kingdom has, has dropped out. Um, we have one in the Netherlands and Belgium, and we're hoping to add uh, Australia before too long. So all of us in our bylaws, we agree to give at least 50% of the proceeds, the money that we raise, to Ring 14 International, and then that's where we fund research grants, that's where we maintain the biobank, um, that's where we uh, do the uh, international research workshops, which are so critical, and things like that. And um, to help us in that is our scientific advisory board. We've got five members on that. My husband serves on that. Pietro serves on that. So those are our um, experts, so to speak, to discern what's good science and what's bad science. Um, so they, they give us guidance in what kind of grants deserve funding and everything. And I, I will stress that, that we really do seek out the best science that's, that's the goal, to, to seek out the best science. And a lot of times, these are really specific Ring 14 grants that have been, um, that we've taken on. So here are some of the projects that we've done in the past. Uh, we did early genetic studies. Um, we organize the biobank. We have a clinical database that parents can contribute to. Um, there's been some study of language in Italy. We tried to do a mouse model, okay? One of the big things in transitional research. So to, to be able to actually come up with a therapy that works for our kids is you have to have a model to be able to work with. Um, our mouse model did not really work out. It's complicated and they're not, they're not viable, but it was, it was a good try. Like, I'm so happy that we had that, but we're still looking for a good model. Uh, we've done gene expression and uh, studies. Um, we're, we're trying to discern if we know what the genes look like, the genotype, how does that translate to behavior, to phenotype, to the expression of the, uh, of the child? And all of this other stuff that uh, we've tried to contribute to. So it's our SAB that kind of leads this uh, research direction. And I'm gonna leave most of that for Marco to talk about. So this is one of the first studies that came out from Ring 14, um, Italy. So this is a long time ago. Um, and I showed this slide because, well, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I know that we all want like 
a cure. We all want a therapy that works for our child. And that's, that's hard, okay? That's hard, so I'm just gonna be upfront about that. And it may be years away, but what I do wanna emphasize is that what we're doing right now is still critical, okay? We're laying the groundwork for something that will lead to that therapy. And it actually, it's helpful now. Um, so this is one of our first papers that we published. Here's Marie, she was actually in this study. So we took blood the very first time that we were over there in Italy. And she was one of the participants where they kind of, it was a new uh, paper just kind of describing the syndrome with a, with a handful of kids. Okay, well, when Marie was in the hospital uh, a couple of years ago when we were getting the feeding tube, um, they've never seen, we're in Dallas, right? We're at Dallas Children's. They've never seen a Ring 14 patient, okay? So it's a teaching hospital, so kind of like in the movies where you come along and somebody presents a case to all the new medical students, right? And get the, the student presenting was using this paper. She had this paper, okay? And I got to say, that's my daughter right there. That's my daughter. I, we helped run and, and fund this paper that they're teaching the other medical students about. So what I want y'all to understand is that these early things that we're doing, they have impact. They're, they're important. They're being used to teach new medical students about our kids. And so um, I just want to encourage y'all in that and say, um, even though I can't promise you a cure next year or in 10 years, what I can say is that what we're doing is medically important and it's, it's necessary and they're, they're necessary bricks that have to be laid before we can get to our goal, which is of course is a better life for our kids. Um, yeah, and it is important, right? Because um, th this syndrome can be quite severe and um, we've lost two of the kids on this page, okay? Um, I don't say that at my fundraisers, but, um, but, it, but it's, imp you know what I mean? There, there's a seriousness that goes along with this. So towards that end, these research workshops that we try to fund, they're so important. It's so important to raise that money and to handpick those people because with such limited funds, we just want to make sure that we've got the best people working on our problems. Um, so, by the way, we're trying to fund our third research workshop right now, and I think that we're almost to our goal, and we should be planning that in 2019, and so very excited about that. Um, No, 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 not at the beginning of 2019. We, we have to have the money in the bank. We have to have the money in the bank to do this. So I know these, these doctors and these researchers, their calendars are literally set a year in advance. And so my husband is constantly reminding me, Isa, we have to, we have to get it on the schedule. We have to do this. And so that, that is important. Um, another thing that we try to do is awareness, okay? So we do have literature, it's available on our website. We have different literature to give to uh, researchers and different literature to give to like caregivers. And on our Facebook page, there are PDFs, you can just download them. At the last conference, I had copies in, uh, in the folders and I just neglected to do that. But um, we do have that available. Um, another thing that we do as far as research uh, awareness goes is we try to attend a, co a conference. In particular, we attend the American Epilepsy Society. They have a big annual meeting 
Uh, every year it's usually at the beginning of December and we hold a table there and we talk to different doctors who come by. We give them literature. We say, if you find some of our children, please, you know, get them in contact with us. Um, but, but it's just a way to be a part of that bigger research prop, you know, uh, community that's all involved with neurology. And I know that we have other areas that we need to focus on too, but that's kind of the area that we've chosen to focus on with our limited resources right now. Um, we also have a website and our social media and stuff like that. Um, our Facebook group, I don't know about y'all, but um, it's a great source of uh, community and just that's how we meet each other. I felt like I knew some of you guys before I even met you. And so it's really nice to have the, those resources at our fingertips. And of course we do these conferences, okay? So we did a family camp in Kentucky uh, about, was that five years ago? something like that five years ago and then we started to move towards a conference so that we could add an educational component as well as uh, the social and community side of it and so we had our first one there uh, in 2016 in San Antonio and then of course this is our second one right now. So one of the things that I want us to understand is that being a part of a rare syndrome, so I want to see us, I want us to envision ourselves as a unique entity with, with this very rare small syndrome, but I also want us to see ourselves in a larger picture, okay? Um, so the, the part, ring 14, isn't critical, but also I wanted to envision us as a whole. So we're also part of this larger group, Ring 14 International. But our organization also contributes to the Epilepsy Leadership Council. So that's a consortium of big and small groups that are all fighting towards curing epilepsy. So lots of rare syndromes in there, lots of big organizations like Epilepsy Foundation, like Cure and things like that. So we have to work separately, but we have to work as a group with all of this because sometimes you need critical mass to get something going. Um, also, our organization is starting to get involved with the Rare Epilepsy Network, and Brandy's going to tell us much more about that later. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about that. Um, but we're also a part of this big community of rare syndromes. And I think that that's really important to identify with them as a whole, to, to have this idea that we're all in this together. Because I can tell you that when you're when you're fundraising and doing stuff, this is a major question. Why should I support a rare syndrome? Why should I support something when there's only like 25 families involved? And I think it's kind of a valid question, okay? For some people, it's not valid. Like for Marie's grandparents, they, they wanna give to a foundation that helps Ring 14. And if it just helps Marie, then they're fine with that. You know what I mean? Um, but for people kind of outside, I think it's a question that you have to ask. Well, because people want their money to um, have impact on a larger scale. And I think one of the ways that we answer this question is we identify with all the rare syndromes. Okay, so rare syndromes are a major health issue in general. So if you group all rare syndromes together, um, there's over 7,000 of them. It's, it's more prevalent than diabetes and cancer combined in the population. So they say that one out of 10 people are affected by a rare syndrome, okay? So when you, when you look at it as a whole and view it as a major health problem, then people are like, okay, I can, I can buy into that. I, I'll support cancer, even if nobody in my family 
has canceled. I'll support heart research, you know what I mean? So we present rare syndromes like that. And then, but the problem then becomes, well, how do you, how do you attack something that is so prevalent, but so unique? You pick one that has touched you and you concentrate on that. And by funding this little bitty organization, you attack a major health problem, okay? So I just wanna kinda arm you with that argument because it actually, it, it works and people, well, first of all, it's true, okay? But people see the value in that, okay? People want to attack major health problems, but how do you attack a major health problem with so many fingers and spines and everything that each one has to be looked at? Well, you just pick one and you dedicate yourself to that. And what we know is that sometimes in these finding these answers to these little bitty syndromes, it has ripple effects. And you may be studying this little syndrome, but you may find out something that helps this syndrome or that syndrome, because that's kind of how science works sometimes. And so even the smallest problems can have huge impacts that you can't foresee at the time. So a big push for pure science, okay? And that, is, is, is the end of our introduction to Ring 14 and um, what we're trying to do. So are there, any, are there any questions about the organization, the structure, or anything like that? Nada, nada? Okay, so let me see how.